Hello, hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thomas. Hey, uh, Brenda, did you want to lead up this one or do you want me to do it? Sure, I can. Yeah. Right, cool. Uh, I'm sorry, before we get started, um, it's, is there a, a link to the updated meeting notes? Because the one I see is just a completely blank template. Um, it's this one. I'll put it in chat. Yeah, we, we recently migrated, so there may be some links to the bit confusing now, not finding the right things. Um, yeah, well, we should probably use the, the new doc. Oh, oh, so, so, uh, oh, sorry. Or the old one. It doesn't matter which one you guys want. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, I always, I'm sorry. I got confused. <laughs> I put the I put in the new one. New one? Uh, new one? New one? Okay. The, the one the calendar is this one, so I was I wasn't sure. Maybe that. Yeah, oh that's that's the one. Oh, that's the one? Okay, cool, cool. Uh, that's the one I'm filling out, so <laughs> yeah. Uh let me copy over and I know we wrote somewhere else the uh some other things you're going to share as well. So let me just put that up. Okay, copy and paste in here. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Bob. I'll give it a few to get started. If I put measure, I'm going to post the link again in the chat for those that just joined. And as usual, if, if folks want to talk about anything in particular, feel free to add items at the end of the agenda um, and put your name on that so we know uh, who they belong to. Okay, um, and also uh, for folks that just joined, um, here's the meeting notes. Um, if you can, please put in your attendance in there, as well as if you have anything that you'd like to talk about, please put them in the agenda. Um, so we can get started. Um, as usual, welcome everyone. Um, this is uh, the co-op community meeting, and as usual, um, adhering to the 
code of conduct uh, for OpenSSF in the Gawk community. So be friendly. Uh, meeting is being recorded and going to be posted on um, YouTube. So um, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we've we want to start as usual uh, with introductions and new members. Uh, is there anyone new that would like to introduce themselves or someone that have hasn't been to um, the meeting in a while that wants to reintroduce himself? Well, I, I guess this is my first Quack community meeting. So um, I'm Ed. I'm, uh, I guess, a freelance software engineer. I've been playing around with Quack. I think I've interacted with a few of you on the Slack, and you seem like a friendly bunch. So I just wanted to do what this is all about. Awesome. Welcome, Ed. Any other takers for introductions? Cool. Uh, if not, it's the uh, first meeting of the new year. We have quite a few things lined up. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, and so just just an overview, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the things that have been going on in the community's contributions as well for other community members. Um, and also talk a little bit about um, what's upcoming for like a Guac V1 release as we're starting to think about it. Uh, you know, look for some stable APIs and, and some um, upcoming um, talks and, and things about Quark. Yeah. So first up, uh, just quick items. Um, we are signing the uh, Quark up for LFX membership. Um, so that if there's something that's, you know, mentorship is interesting to you or you would like to be a mentee, maybe this is, this is um, your first time contributing to Quark or or even open source in general, um, do take a look at um, the LFX uh, mentorship program. Uh, I'm not sure anyone has done the mentorship program. Um, I think at least it, it is new to me, so I'm, I'm very curious about it. But if anyone on the call has experience with that and wants to say a few words, um, do, do feel free to. Cool. Uh, so, if not, uh, yeah, go uh, ahead. I was just gonna say, uh, I've worked. Pardon me. I've worked uh, tangentially with with some of it. I've heard experiences from others who have done um, <clears throat> the program. It's mostly just a way for for folks who are relatively new to open source or also new to potentially even um, the field that that they might be uh, wanting to work in. So, like students or 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 hobbyists. Um, uh, and stuff. Um, uh, it seems to just be uh, a way for um, to get folks like that to come contribute, and that come, those contributions come in a bunch of different fat, you know uh, uh, categories. That it could be hey, helping out with the documentation. It could be uh, helping out uh, understanding, you know, with the issues. It could be also implementing, you know, some features. Um, uh, and then the idea would be that, you know, the maintainers of the project or core contributors to the project who really understand the project can help guide those mentees to better understand the stuff and, 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 and that sort of thing. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Cool. Um, all right. So next up. We're going to dive right into new things um, going on in Quark. So I think the, the first agenda item we have is an uh, overview of the design for upcoming experimental REST API. Um, Marco, the other Marco Dekas, uh, we have two Marcos in this community already. So uh, it's a good indicator of a <laughs> digital principle. Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so we discussed this a little bit in the last community meeting, but we're going to add a REST API to Guac um, that serves some of the use cases that the GraphQL doesn't meet. The GraphQL API doesn't meet. Um, we're going to add some analysis endpoints to this, um, and also some more user-friendly endpoints. Um, say, if you want to receive, get your information in, in Perl form, 
um, which the, the GraphQL API can't do. Um, and yeah, at a very high level, the design is that the this API is just gonna um, make requests to the GraphQL API. Um, and this way it'll work for all of the backends um, in the future. And especially for some analysis endpoints, we can bypass the GraphQL API and go directly to the backends. Um, that's definitely an opti optimization we can do. Um, but yeah, so that's the, the high level design. Um, if anybody has any, any feedback or use cases, um, we'd love to hear it because this is definitely uh, meant to be user friendly and to serve specific use cases. Um, you can message on the Slack or there's also a GitHub issue talking about this more in depth. Thanks. Can you link that issue? Yeah, um, sure. Getting the issue and also maybe could you just uh, give and maybe just like a quick elevator pitch overview on like the, the, the kind of technologies that you are gravitating towards in, in the issue. Yep. Um, yeah, I can give the overview and then I'll link the issue. Um, we're going to use a um, code generator for the for the server code um, to generate server stubs. Um, and this, uh, we're going to use o, uh, OAPI code gen. Um, and it's going to generate code from a, the schema. So this is going to, the design is a schema first API. Um, the schema is going to be in open API. Um, which I think previously was called Swagger. Um, so we'll specify the schema in that, um, the endpoints in that, and then the server code will be generated. Um, and we will also be able to generate um, client code in in Go um, and in other languages as well. Awesome. Thanks, Marco. Um, and Pop has helped put the, the, the link in the meeting notes, so thanks. Thanks. Awesome. Um, next up, path um, on the custom directive for GraphQL, um, which uh, was contributed recently. I'm not sure yes. whether um, the contributor is in this meeting as well. That yeah, wants to see a few yeah, they're not. OK. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I'm probably pronouncing her name wrong. Kunchin. Um, so she she is uh, from Guidewire. Uh, so they they actually uh, two big you know very useful PRs was like in terms of the GraphQL uh, GraphQL directives. So what this allows us to do, and I'll, I'll go into a bit of a demo. But basically, what this the custom directives allow us to do is, um, you know, there was a lot of questions coming in. It's like how do I figure out what the parl of you know a specific package is, for example, you know, is there a way for the GraphQL to tell me the parl? Um, and also, is there better ways to query GraphQL? Okay, so if there's, you know, I don't know the exact, you know, string for string match for it. Like, is there a way I can do, you know, a, a sub, sub match kind of thing with the contains or a start with, for example. So this allows us to quickly, you know, in, in the GraphQL program or, you know, uh, in some of the queries, we can start, we can start using some of this and it allows us to, you know, get more useful information for the different packages. So, Figure out the parl for a specific, you know, unknown unknown package. At the same time, you know, start querying for things that are you might not know fully exactly what the you know the match the, the text match might be, but you can do a contains or a start with and quickly figure that out. So here I'll show you a quick demo on exactly what this kind of looks like. Uh, so all right, um, can everybody see that? See my screen? All right, awesome. Um, so the first thing I'm going to show off. So the you know in terms of figuring out the parl, right? So for example, I'm going in here and, you know, I want to search for like in this case, right? So I was like, okay. And I'm combining two different things here together. So here is that specific filter, which is the, um, and I'll move this a little bit to, if I can, uh, here we go. Um, so what this is kind of showing me is I'm adding a filter in here and I want to filter on name, right? So namespace, name and name. And I want to do, I want to do a contains operation. And if I, instead, if I want to, if I want to do a starts with, then I can do a, just do a, uh, I think it's going to start with like this, and then I can do it that way, right? Um, so contains, well, I want to see, give me all the things that contain uh, lib audit, basically, right? So if I start that query, so now what it's going to do, instead of instead of me having to figure out, okay, because there could be multiple, right? in this case, there are multiple, there's a lib, lib 
libedacommon, um, and then there's different versions of it, right? Uh, and yeah, in this case, there's two, looks like, libotic comments. Um, but I, I, you know, I, maybe I didn't know, for example, what the, what it could be, right, in, the, in this case uh, for this Ubuntu package um, or Debian package, I'm sorry. Uh, so what this allows us to do is quickly search for that, like it narrows that down for you automatically. And at the same time, here's the other piece in here, it's going to give you the Perl back. So if this is like, you know, a lot of the queries actually use Perls, for example, to start the query process, the patch planning, um, you know, the, those different things. Now you can figure out automatically, hey, this is the actual Perl that I want to use. So I can take this. And I can use that in my CLI queries and wherever else, you know, the REST API and all those kind of things in the future. So, it, you know, it combines those, a lot of problems, a lot of problems that people were having in terms of like, hey, how do I figure the Perl out? And is there a quick way of like, can I filter on things if I don't know the exact name of things, for examples, or exact values? Um, another example, for example, is like you can do it in embedded things. So, so this was this was an embedded example, but you can also do, so this was a nested example. But you can do direct ones also. Um, so, for example, uh, in the salsa, I want to know, if, you know, if who, was it built was it built by you know uh, Cloud Build here, for example. I can do that. You know, filter on everything that was built by Cloud Build in this case. And I, again, I don't know what version it is. It could be different versions and all that kind of stuff. But it's going to give me everything back, and I can narrow stuff down from there. Uh, another example is like for the Hazas bomb. Like this is the URI piece, right? So there's a specific URI. I know that it should be something like this, you know, vulnerability image latest, but I don't know the, again, the full URI. So I can, I can, I can search that and I'll come back with, oh, here's one that matches exactly, uh, matches that contains and, you know, I don't have to search. So it, it adds a lot more functionality to the GraphQL API piece. Any questions on that piece? I have a quick question. This this is um enabled for all backends or specific backends? This is enabled for all backends. Awesome. So this is this is on top. This is on this is for graph this is a GraphQL layer. So all the backends below it automatically support it. So it'll work for Sweet. Int, Orango, everything in between. Nice. Cool. Thanks, Bob. Um well, the next item is for you as well. So, <laughs> uh, All right. update for the vulnerability CLI. Yes. So, let me share my screen again. Sorry. Oh, I lost my zoom. Okay. Here. So um, another uh, so the, another feedback that we got from a lot of people, um, a lot of, a lot of users is basically they have you know a lot of the queries again use Perl, but you might not know the Perl or you might not want to you know utilize the Perl, especially in the vulnerability case, right? Because the vulnerability CLI, uh, you know, you you might want to be like, hey, I want I want to see all the uh, vulnerabilities that are in my that are part of this specific S bomb, right? And the the Perl in that case might not be a fully qualified Perl, right? It could be something that Guam generated. So it's a lot harder for you to start that query with. So one of the feedback that we got is like, how do we make that simpler? How do we make it easier? So one of the things, and there's a lot of work that got done in the back end uh, in terms of like how how uh, has S bomb and like all those different verbs in the background work. Um, so th what this is doing is utilizing some of that capabilities that was done in the background. So now Guac One, and this has actually been updated in the in the Guac Docs also. So you can, if you go check out the vulnerability CLI in the Guac Docs, you'll see that the, there's two options now, right? You can you can either search with uh, the the SBOMS URI or you can search with the Perl, right? So you have two different options now. So if you remember, um, I, I just showed it off right there. It was the vulnerability image latest, right? We did we figured out what the URI was based on the GraphQL. Um, so based off the URI, I can actually so I can start my query, pass in that URI because the SBOM should be unique, right? So for the SPDX and Cyclone DX, there the namespace as well as the um, um, the namespace in uh, it's, uh, SPDX. Uh, SPDX namespace should be yeah yeah. yeah. 
unique. And then the URI for Cyclone DX, I believe is the, is the thing for it. For Cyclone DX should always be unique for all the SBOMs. So this allows us to query based off that. And what this does is that it aggregates, again, similarly, it's gonna aggregate everything because it knows, because the SBOM knows exactly what dependencies it has. So it can go in and figure out, okay, are there vulnerabilities associated with it? And then can it give you that answer back? Um, starting from this point, right, we can also, you know, if, like, for example, devs.dev and all those things are all the different services are running for Guac. Again, it will account for all those pieces also. So if there's transitor dependencies that may contain vulnerabilities, all that will show up automatically here based off your SBOM. Similarly, right, let's say you do know the, you know, the, the, the Perl, you can do the same thing and you'll get a similar result block, uh, result back. So you can see the two things. Uh, they're, in, they're in different orders, uh, but you can see that vulnerabilities are both the same uh, on, in both the different tables. Um, so that's, and then you can, of course, visualize it in a, in a better way. But this allows us to, I think there was a lot of, you know, like the headache with using pearls in some of these cases, especially in vulnerabilities, right? It's how do we, how do we work around this? So this, this helps us um, quickly, quickly search for things and, and find the right answer. That's super cool. Yeah, I think especially with like the hopefully finalization of the the SSDF um, EO form, you know, we'll, in a few months we'll just, right. just look up by as form namespace. Uh, exactly, will yeah. be useful. Yeah, and uh, this so I uh, we just did a release for Guac uh, yesterday, so all this has been pushed out uh, in the latest release. So this is this is functionality. So that's why the Guac the uh, doc documentation has been updated. So you can go utilize this in the latest release as well as the um, uh, the, uh, the GraphQL directives. The documentation has not been updated for the GraphQL directives yet. So that that is an action item that uh, we'll go update um, so that there's more uh, documentation around it so people can start utilizing it. But the functionality is there. Cool. Um, yeah, and, and again, it's a reminder, right? Um, code contributions are great, but all, all contributions are good. <laughs> so if, if this, this is something that, that um, you know, documentation is, is a good way to kind of like get into and understand the project, then we'll be happy to help folks as well navigate that, understand like, you know, documentation is, is always a work in progress as, with, with the code. So any, if you see anything that that stands out that that may be wrong, or you know, please feel free to highlight highlight it to us, or feel free to open up the yeah. And and then for this release, I do want to call out. I think I mean um, he's in this meeting right now, so I just want to say Ridwan has been. I think he's a first time contributions for this release. So I want to call that out. Like it was uh, he worked on the uh, updates to the OCI collector. Um, so there there's. A lot of changes uh, on in the new new release for Guac. So, um, thanks thanks Ridwan for the you know joining us uh, for the uh, contributing back to Guac. It's been great. Happy to contribute. Awesome. Um, I added in the next item, which is actually um, has to also associate the Ridwan, <laughs> which is uh, the bug around the 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 pull checks. Um, so I know we had a back and forth with the pill, the pill maintainers. Um, the stem of this issue is within um, certain certain pull strings that we have. Um, we use a sub path that may start with a dot slash or dot dot slash. Um, some of this is an artifact of how we ex we express how files look like. Uh, some of it is also just, you know, some S bombs that, that other tools create some may have some of these. Um, so Ridwan has, has helped to fold out this issue with, uh, Perl maintainers. We had a little bit of back and forth with them. I think we agree that, um, you know, there is a, a bit of drift between the current spec and the current implementations of that people do of the spec. And so we are, we are appealing to kind of say, okay, you know, we understand that not everyone's implementing a spec correctly, but there's still information we don't want to lose by just saying, like, oh, this is an invalid poll. Um, so I think according to Philip's response to the issue, he says 
he's okay with magic and then uh, i know path just pinged on uh the pr video one that you had on on po on the pogo code so we, we'll see how um whether they'll be able to merge at the end hopefully um if not i think the alternative that that i think i i chat with path about um would be at least for the the file names to take the hours up path and make it a qualifier on the version okay so that would be our workaround should we decide that you know it's not gonna we're not gonna merge it that way yeah um is there any other cases where where that that brings that um the issue up or is this specific just the only one that you that you ran into yeah the yeah, just for context, it's really around SPDX files and the way they're described. Usually, even as per the spec of SPDX, uh, all the file paths will have the relative dot slash prefix on it. So that, that's really where I've only run into it. Um, as far as making it a qualifier, I don't really think that that's really an issue. I mean, to be honest with you, I'm not really using the the files themselves from the SPDX. So I'm not consuming that part. Um, so I'd, I'd have to like think about it more, but okay. from a high level, yeah. it, it unblocks ingestion of SBOM. So that would be yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that the solution, oh yeah, just like kind of stripping it. Um, if it's a dot slash, um, Sounds good. I, I think we'll we'll see whether Philippe's able to merge a PR then in the sense that we can just kind of leave it for now. But um yeah, I think longer term we need to figure out um what we want to found the, the found name. So I think also exercising like what paths are actually people exercising the found names. I know found names have been have become a little bit of a star mini star graphs within the the GraphQL model. So I think that's something that, that we will, we will have to handle, but thanks for Don for, for helping look into this and following up with Paul. Um, next up and our second last uh, item is, um, uh, thinking about V1.0 release, um, I'm gonna have a TLDR, but then I think I think other other maintainers can can chime in a little bit on this. Um, um, the the main aspect of um, V1.0 is really like stability of the GraphQL API, um, and I think one of the one of the, the the main kind of measures that we are we are adopt adopting or kind of looking at here is like oh if the GraphQL interface has not changed over three months you know i think we can say that it's fairly stable enough to to be a a, a one um and a few other things as in this issue here that's linked um but yeah i think i'm just going to open up the floor i i think path and mike other other maintainers um and also contributors if you have any thoughts on, you know, what are, what are other maybe things that um, we may be missing or just talk a little bit about the requirements. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> just the you know, next piece is definitely having the persistent backend, the one that's optimized and that the community can, uh, can, community can utilize. So that's the next piece. Um, and just making sure that's tested. Uh, so testing it with, you know, large data sets just, just to make sure that it doesn't fall over kind of thing, just can handle large, uh, large inputs and be able to query, uh, you know, in an acceptable time, basically. Um, the other piece was uh, we are having, we were having issues with um, utilizing mats, uh, well, actually any kind of pub sub actually, right? Because it's going to have where um, there was an issue because we were in, right, how we were using the pub sub is like we were taking the SBOM, for example, and putting that into the queue. Uh, this kind of led to the size issue because now the actual events that went into the pub sub were too massive. So we have been introducing other ways to get around this. Um, so we're uh, that there's an open PRs right now that I'm kind of working through. It's like introducing like a blob store 
where the, you know, for example, the SBOM gets stored into that specific blob store, and then your the event basically just contains an address to it. So the ingester just picks it up and uh, carries forward with the, the rest of the things. So the collector, so the collector would, you know, grab the SBOM for whatever location it is, put that into the blob store, put a copy of it, and then the ingester would take that from the blob store and kind of continue forward. So this kind of allows us, and the we were utilizing the uh, Go Cloud. So that that does add like the abstraction layer above this. So people can use an S3, people can use Azure, you know, uh, Google Cloud Bucket, whatever they kind of want to for their blob store. They're not restricting anybody to a specific thing. Um, and then for the actual like Docker Compose, like when people are trying to like, you know, just utilize it uh, just for their own demo purposes, you know, we can have like a persistent store, uh, persistent store that, that kind of links the collector and the ingester together. So, you know, you don't have a disconnect or you have to go, you don't have to go set up like an S3 bucket on your own kind of thing. You can just, you, uh, everything kind of will, will work seamlessly as it as it does currently. Uh, but then it does in the future allow, you know, the actual, uh, actual uh, you know, production use cases, people can use S3 buckets or whatever else they kind of want to. Um, the other piece, uh, I think we also want to start putting in, like, I think people have asked, like, hey, can we use something besides stats, like Kafka and all those kind of things? Again, uh, Go Cloud allows uh, abstraction at the top sub level too. So that's another thing that I'm going to be looking into to see how that kind of works. And this allows us to, you know, if you if you want to use Nats, if you want to use Kafka, you want to use something else that's supported by Go Cloud, uh, we can kind of go forward with that. Um, I'll hand it to Mike. If you had your hand raised first, and then yeah, read yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I think also from. Um, yeah, so I agree with all those things as as being stuff that we want to gotta hit for like a, a 1.0 release. I also think um, doing something akin to either like a case study with a potential end user or something like that, I think would really help us prove out that we're ready for 1.0. Um, just because like I I don't want us to like a uh, uh, a lot of these non functional sort of requirements are are great as far as like. Um, you know, making sure that we could scale and we can be ready for, for what we need to sort of support that. But I also want to make sure that, you know, um, and, and this is where we could probably reach out to the, either the end user working group or, or, or some of the folks, you know, reach out to some of the other folks at, at OpenSSF who work with um, end users to see if we can maybe do like a case study with a potential um, end user, just because I, I want to make sure that like when we release 1.0, you know, that, that, that an end user can actually, you, you know, is looking at Guac and actually like, hey, we solve these sorts of problems and, and making sure that we can use that almost as like acceptance criteria for, for 1.0. Because um, we just want to make sure we don't miss anything, especially for such a big release, at least in, in my opinion. Uh, Ridwan? Yeah, I was just going to ask about whether... Auth N or Auth C is on the 1.0 uh, release. I mean, more probably important would be Auth Z just because there's so many different types of data floating around within the graph. It's and having everybody access it at this point in time is seems a little um, overreaching. So I, I'm just wondering if that's if there's any sort of plans to to address that in the one before 1.0. I think um, based on the discussion of Eddie's authorization, um, Eddie's on the GraphQL side, that's something that we kind of looked at initially, but it was quite a complicated um, model. Uh, I think I know Mike and um, Puff and other folks have been playing around with a proxy type um, authentication slash authorization and all multiple kind of instances for different kind of um, inflow of data. Uh, but yeah I, I, yeah, I think maybe you guys can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just real quick. I mean, it's definitely something we, we can look at. There, is, there are some um, practical concerns just from the, the standpoint of a lot of the very mature libraries around Auth Z for GraphQL all are paid, um, so it, it might just be you know at, at some level like certain things we might just not be able to do just because um, at least from a, an open source standpoint like there's nothing to prevent 
like I think we are looking at, um, we've been talking with with some of the folks uh, around this, and I believe there's a GraphQL standard around Auth Z that is being developed. Um, we're still trying to kind of like find some of those folks to kind of pull them in, but. Uh, Regardless, one of the things that we don't want to do is we don't want to end up in a situation where we would stop anybody from potentially integrating one of those closed source solu auth Z solutions into their guac if they needed to. Um, so that's definitely something we're, we're, we're looking at. Uh, but as far as exactly if, if this would fit 1.0, I think we need to do a little bit more investigation. Yeah, I, I do have questions on like... Um... Maybe, maybe um, if you can kind of like create an issue uh, and I'll talk about like, just like what the use cases is like kind of like, you know, um, how fine grain you're looking at and like maybe that can also inform maybe the assets and other solutions you can do to, to make some of that easier as well. Yeah, that, that sounds good. I mean, if there's no existing issue, I'm happy to at least start that discussion. Um, and another question that I had and kind of tangential maybe, or, or related, which is, is the intention for a guac one to, uh, basically leverage the rest APIs. And if like, meaning that like all that logic that happens in guac one for query or whatever that moves to rest API, is that in scope for 1.0 or is that, uh, is that not? Because then my follow-up question would be, could we add authorization there too? I think the 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 first question is in scope for one point um, I think it based on I think where we see the timeline of one point it'll probably be be done before one point uh, yeah. I don't think we we've tied it because it's I think we're we're treating that as a like the one point stability for API. I think we're only looking at GraphQL, so the rest API will kind of be still in the experimental phase. So it isn't tied with one point um, my, if you were, if I were to give a, a estimate, which is usually wrong, uh, I would say it's probably going to be done before, um, uh, before 1.0, um, and awesome. authorization and authentication, I think on the rest API, I think that there, there are quite a few options around that. I think I, I know there are a few open source solutions that I know I've used like Keycloak and I know we have. I'm very happy folks on the call. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, I, I think REST API could be something that, that has a, a few more available solutions to do uh, off year around. Awesome. Sounds good. I'll actually just leave a comment on the, the REST API issue with asking about that, and then we can continue the combo. Awesome. Thanks, folks. Thanks, you. Jeff. Yeah, I do want to kind of respond to Mike and Read one first before I get to my point. Um, I th I think that focusing 1.0 on the API stability and backend stability, like that's coming about because we desperately want to build these higher level features. Like we we want to add auth and auth C. We want to add all these queries and and user features. And I I think putting a, a, a stake in the ground and saying, okay, the API is done, the GraphQL API is done, the backend is done, really unlocks us to do that. And so focusing on the those first two things will will make us like be able to rapidly add features. And and like the, the auth stuff, it's like, hey, we, we need everybody we, everybody knows we need to do auth and auth C and it's very important, but it's like let's get the the core part done so that we can add that on. Um, so I don't know if it's, you know, it, it's not in scope right now. Maybe we can add it, maybe we, we don't, but I, it, my opinion is, is if we, if we do say call the API 1.0 and, and that, that, that really opens us up to doing a lot more of the stuff people need but more quickly, if we can put this kind of stuff behind us. Um, so on that note. I, I I don't have anything to add to the list on the on the issue. I think it's good. I I think that we're w one thing after watching like API changes in the last few months. I don't think we're just going to magically land upon API stability by accident. So right now we have no uh, bar for API changes. Anything that sounds good and seems 
seems like an improvement we we're we're happy to to uh to accept and 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 do um if we you know we're not going to just magically sit around and say oh it's been three months since the last api change or, or one month or two months um i think if we're if we're serious about getting to this point we will need to enter a phase where we raise the bar for api changes and see like the bar won't be infinite like we can still you know we could let's say we raise the bar and say hey we're only going to make changes if we really think it's going to break if we don't do it or you know if it's it, it's going to put us in a hole um and then at that point go through a like a probationary period and see if if that can stand for that period of time and if it does then we can say we're stable and if it doesn't then we we make the change and then we keep we reset the clock so um that's just my point is i think i think we'll we'll want to go to a point where we try to call it stable and and see if 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 it is rather than just just wait uh mike yeah, so so I, I completely agree with you on um uh not making auth Z um a priority. The only caveat or asterisk I would add on there is just I do think we should evaluate that anything we do with the API would make auth Z harder in the future. Um just because there there's there's certain practical things um just based on on some of our initial research that showed that like Actually, if you structure your API this way, it makes the auth Z component, you know, either easier or harder. And so I just want to make sure that we, on that end, we're not doing anything that would like, oh, we're shooting ourselves in the foot in the future because we didn't realize that we should have structured this thing this way or, or whatever. Um, and I don't want to get too deep into to any other things, but just for example, I know that some of the auth Z elements require sort of potential changes to the API itself. Um, and some of the potential auth Z, uh, like libraries are essentially like layers on top of, uh, GraphQL, where you essentially say, Hey, this thing, actually this data element is owned by this other, you know, identity or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I, I know I, I saw this in... Uh, one of the comments, which um, I, I think is something that I'm not sure whether we we shared a group. So, um, over the last uh, December, CISA put out a response for uh, RC for software identify software identifiers. I don't know whether we're I'm guessing it's it's been a while since we we talked about that, but um. A couple of us put together a response um, to that, which I'm trying to find in my background right now. Um, basically, uh, TLDR was he set put out a, a white paper on what are software identifiers and what should be the best practices. What kind of model should we like um, create registration identifiers? Who should own the software identifiers? And that that kind of puts us squarely in a lot of the things that we are doing. Um, and what we're seeing from different response from different sources, uh, we put together a response to that, and we we are actively uh, working with um, Purdue University, so uh, Santiago and Soham, uh, Soham who's on the call, uh, we're starting to look at this problem as well. You know, this is, looks at like the the snowflake identifier issues um, that were in, initially brought up as well. So that is something that we are continuously also um, looking at. And if I find that document that we submitted to CISA, I will put it in the, the meeting notes. Cool. Um, any any more thoughts, questions around 1.0? Uh, if not, we have our the, the, the last, the last put up point for now. All right, so Mike, the last one is, is, is yours. Uh, so yeah, so this is, is still fairly early on, um, but there has been um, 
some discussion uh, with OpenSSF uh, to host uh, a webinar on Guac. I'm not sure if folks had seen a few months ago, um, a bunch of us had done a, a webinar um, with the OpenSSF on behalf of Salsa, like kind of an introduction to Salsa, how to get started, yada, yada. Um, I think, uh, you know, we're looking to do the same thing for Guac. So this would be for the broader Guac community, folks who are really like just hearing about Guac or, or you know, they've heard about Guac, but really haven't had a time to dive in or they're, they're like looking to kind of get a little bit more hands-on. And so uh, right now it's, once again, it's very tentative. It hasn't been, um, uh, it hasn't been confirmed yet, but the idea would be, um, you know, a few either core contributors and maintainers uh, come in. Um, you know, we bring in a bunch of different folks uh, from across the community and 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 pull in. You know, it's going to be obviously open to the public um, to ch you know talk through walk some of the basics, like you know why, uh, and it'll be like an hour or so. Um, you know, why why are uh, why did we create walk? What is walk actually doing? What sorts of problems does this walk solve? Where is it going? And you know, probably a, a very basic like, here's how to get started, uh, something like that. Um, and uh, I'll obviously, as time progresses, I'll, I'll and, and more details come out, I'll inform the rest of the group in in Guac Chat. Awesome. Um, let me just take a look. Um, cool. I don't think we have any more agenda items. Uh, any thoughts? Uh, anything that has come up, up come to mind? Any any folks on the call? Anything that um, issues, PRs that you think we should be looking at, or something that that needs review that that you know uh, requires some eyes on it. And any future topics that people want to talk about at the next community meeting, maybe a demo, maybe use cases, um, problems, solutions, both equally good. Awesome. If not, we have about a little bit more than 10 minutes back for everyone. Thank you very much. Have a good Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Bye.